Thank you for joining Women in Data Boston Chapters Virtual Symposium. Uh, this is the first installment of our three-part series across the month of June, throughout which we'll be sharing perspectives on career journeys and pathways within data and analytics, as well as highlighting important areas of application within various industries. For those of you who may be new to Women in Data, uh, we are a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase diversity in data careers. We provide awareness, education, and, and advancement to women in the tech industry, specifically in analytics, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, today's speaker, which we're very excited to have, is Liz Schneider, product manager at IBM Watson Health. Uh, throughout her career at IBM, Liz has served in several roles and worked across various markets, including retail, consumer products, transportation, and life sciences. Her current work at IBM as the offering lead for Watson Care Manager, an integrated care management solution used by government employer and healthcare provider customers to improve outcomes for, variable, for vulnerable and at-risk populations. Uh, today, Liz will be speaking on the usage of big data to make a difference in public health. And with that being said, I'm going to turn the floor over to Liz. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, I guess evening here on the East Coast, but people might be dialing in remotely as well. So wherever in the world you may be, thank you for joining. Um, and thank you for having me, Women in Data. So my name is Liz Schnitter. As they said, I'm currently working at IBM as an offering manager for Watson Care Manager. I'm gonna tell you all about what that means and what that product does and how it connects up and uses data. But just wanted to say that um, I've had a bit of a um, kind of diverse career working through many different roles and I eventually found my way into healthcare technology, which I love. Um, and I think it's really important that we participate in these kinds of organizations like Women in Data to give back, to connect with other women who share similar interests, who are looking to be inspired by the work that each other does, and that we help lift one another up. So I, I really support this mission. Um, briefly on my career journey, so maybe starting from the bottom, I, I did grow up in New Jersey. Um, I went to American University down in DC and studied business, um, ended up taking a job in DC as a public sector consultant at Booz Allen Hamilton. So that meant that my customers were all very serious. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the IRS, the Smithsonian Museum. Um, and I worked there for about three years before I came back up to New York City and got my MBA at New York University. Stern School of Business was fantastic. I loved New York. I stayed here. I'm still here <laughs> over 10 years later. And I took my first job coming out of my MBA as a consultant again, but this time at IBM at the Global Business Services Business Unit. And that's where I got my broader experience. So working across various different industries, working um, as a strategy consultant on how to help them manage through change, how to help them improve their organizational effectiveness and improving their process design. Um, from that, I, I never, I guess you can never really anticipate where you're gonna end up. Um, and I had a really amazing opportunity um, where I was invited to join the new business unit, IBM Watson Health. The general manager that was starting um, working with that team needed a chief of staff, someone to help them navigate IBM um, and also to help her with building up an, an entirely new team. So I got pulled in there and in exchange for me helping her, she taught me everything she knew about healthcare, which was pretty incredible. It was my first time working in healthcare. I was new to the industry. It's complex. I'm still wrapping my head around it, but I decided to stay. So after that year long project, um, I was offered a role working on one of the products there in Watson Health. So now I find myself here um, in Watson Health working on a product called Watson Care Manager, something that I never could have anticipated coming out of undergrad, even coming out of my MBA. So you never know where your path will take you. Maybe for those of you who aren't very familiar with Watson Health, let me give you um, a little bit of a background and kind of level set before I dive into some of the specifics on, on the product that I work on. So the, the promise of Watson Health is that we are committed to help building smarter health ecosystems. What does that mean? We wanna help simplify processes, we wanna help find better care insights using data, 
and faster breakthroughs using data and improving the experiences of all the people who are working in healthcare and especially the experiences of the patients and the citizens themselves who are receiving the care around the world. And the way that we've organized ourselves in Watson Health is across these five different groups. And you can think of them as government health and human services, which is focused on how do you help citizens and residents? How do you modernize the government health and social programs to help improve people who are um, uh, vulnerable? Then you look at the payer and provider area. This is health insurance companies, hospital networks, accountable care organizations, uh, nursing homes, uh, mental health facilities, all of these different organizations that are providing care and helping to fund and pay for that care. Um, then our third group that provides solutions for the imaging space. Imaging meaning all of the different images that you're um, receiving when you're getting your MRIs and your CAT scans, um, that Watson Health is able to read these images and pull out insights to help the radiologist to ensure that things aren't missed in the reading. Then in the fourth column, you've got oncology. Uh, Watson for Oncology was one of our first offerings and it's something that we were really well known for at the very beginning a few years back. Um, it's, it's still one of our most impressive products. Um, imagine being able to support doctors in identifying what the right um, uh, suggested care pathways would be for someone who has a cancer diagnosis and being able to find the right clinical trials for that person to ensure that they have the best chances of improving their health outcomes. And then finally, last but not least, our life sciences team that's working using data and analytics to launch new treatments. So trying to help those brilliant people in, in the science space who are looking at um, creating new solutions to people, um, people's diseases and, ch and healthcare challenges. So when you think of Watson Health, there are, I don't know, probably at this point over 60 different offerings, and they fall in one of these five different buckets. And what I'd like to do is talk to you about my, my little piece of the world that falls within the government health and human services space. So before we get into the specifics of the product, maybe to set a little bit of the stage, um, this group cares a lot about data. And so I'm going to share a couple statistics with you all. Um, when you think about your own life and the lives of your families and friends, um, there's no one case that is the same. Everyone kind of requires a unique uh, set of treatments, unique care, unique support. Um, they're going to have complex needs across wellness and nutrition and housing and transportation and safety and mental health. And everyone's trying to navigate. Like, does my insurance apply at this doctor's office? Can I get um, food stamps benefits in my state if I'm under a certain income level? You know, how do I navigate all of these complex processes across like government benefits and hospital networks and my insurance company? And there's so many different phone calls I need to make. And it's really complex. And when you think about these complex cases, the most complex cases, national health expenses in the U.S. were over 3.6 trillion dollars in 2019 and 50% of that was spent on the super utilizers alone. Super utilizer meaning the, the individuals who needed the most care. So if you are generally healthy, you're not going to fall in the super utilizer bucket. But there are people who are struggling with multiple chronic conditions, mental health challenges. Maybe they have unstable housing. Um, and those individuals are the ones who need the most help. Those are the people that we focus on helping in the government health and human services space. So when you think about what the solution should be, this is government and um, provider networks and insurance companies and nonprofit organizations, how can connecting all of these different organizations in the community make a difference? Here's a couple more stats. Think about all of these different vulnerable populations. You've got out of the whole U.S. population, 52 million, more than that, are over the age of 65. Those are going to be the individuals who are more isolated, who require additional care, who might have multiple conditions that they're juggling. You've also got one in five Americans um, who are experiencing mental illness, which is an incredibly high number when you think about you and your close friend group who might be struggling 
with some mental illness that might need more support. And then think about other types of vulnerable populations, like teenagers in the U.S. who are in the foster care system. In one year alone, about 23,000 of them are going to be graduating out of foster care. Those are 18-year-olds who are now living on their own, who may not have the mentorship and support to find supportive housing, um, continue their education, find a job, and be able to um, get their feet on the ground to have a, um, a productive life. And then you also think about all of these people who need help. They all have family members who are then supporting them. 32 hours per week typically is spent by family members who are managing care for their loved ones. Um, I'm thinking about my grandmother living in a nursing home and all of the work that my mom and aunt have to do to help support my grandma and ensure that she's receiving the right care. I'm sure you all have someone in mind similar. So if you think about all of these different types of populations, this is just a small um, sampling of the types of people who need help from the healthcare system. And I'm trying to help us think about healthcare as broader than like the typical going to your primary care doctor, um, uh, more narrow uh, view of what healthcare can be. And so now we've, we've finally come to the page that talks about my, my product. So Watson Care Manager, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be here talking to you guys about a product that I love, one that I've been supporting for four years now. Um, and rather than telling you about all of the amazing features and widgets and capabilities and security that we address, why don't I tell you a couple stories about the different types of populations that we support? So let's start on the left-hand side with some of those logos. We have a few reference customers that are doing some really incredible work to help people. And when you think about how data can support vulnerable populations and how technology is used to apply that data, um, these types of uh, use cases and case studies are the best examples of how to use technology and data to do good in this world. So Montgomery County in Ohio, we actually partner with um, a judge by the name of Judge Capizzi, who is in charge of a juvenile court. And they are responsible for helping juveniles who enter the court system rather than putting them through um, incarceration. How do you find them mentorship and support programs and um, educational programs and uh, work programs so that throughout their teenage years, they can have a more stable lifestyle and support network um, to keep them out of the jail system. The goal being that having someone in jail for a year and then putting them back on, on the streets is not gonna change the outcomes. They need um, a support system to help them through that transition. The second logo there is for HealthQuest. And HealthQuest actually recently changed its name. Um, they're located up in upstate New York, and they are a provider network that supports um, various individuals who have chronic health conditions. So think of like diabetes management and uh, COPD. And what they've done is they've created a risk score and they use the data um, to calculate that risk score and determine what kind of support the individual needs to best manage their health care. Then the third logo is uh, for Delaware. In Delaware, they have a really impressive return to work program where they're helping people who are unemployed to get training, get supplies, get all of the different support services that they need in order to get back into the workforce. For Aspirinet, the fourth logo there, um, you've got an organization that does really amazing things in California. Um, they are working with those foster care agencies and in, ensuring that the individuals as they're aging out of foster care are receiving the support that they need um, when they're 18 and they start transitioning to living on their own um, and moving out of their foster home. Sonoma County in California is um, one of our favorite stories to tell as well. So unfortunately, after they experienced the wildfires, they noticed an uptick in increased homelessness in the area since many people's homes were destroyed. And they needed to find a better 
um, way to work together across multiple government agencies to bring those people um, the kind of support that they need to find housing, find stable work, find mental health services and, and other kinds of support um, to get them uh, back into stable housing. And so those are all kind of existing stories that we have and ways that Watson Care Managers use to help various different populations. On the right hand side, though, we're all living through this COVID-19 pandemic right now. And um, for those of us who are uh, at home kind of quarantining or choosing to, to self-isolate to keep the rest of the community safe, thank you for your efforts. Um, we are seeing that the government and, and employers, different companies are trying to figure out how they're going to open up the economy again. How do you get people out of their houses after they've been home for three months and that people are understandably concerned about contracting the virus and continuing the spread? So we've got two examples here on the right. So on, on the top right, we've got our persona, Sheila. You can think of her um, as a 72-year-old widow, someone who's living alone. She might have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, she doesn't want to leave the safety of her house. Her family lives far away. She doesn't want to bother her daughter. She's worried about medical costs. Her refrigerator is starting to go bare. And she's scared to leave her home to go to the grocery store because of the virus. So we hear this story all the time. And we understand that state and local governments are starting to mobilize healthcare workers, social uh, services workers, who are going to be doing outreach and support for people like Sheila. And then kind of the, the contrasting story on the bottom is how companies are thinking about reopening. Not only do they have to worry about employees in their corporate offices, but what about stores and bank branches and manufacturing facilities? How are they going to protect employees and their customers and the products that they're producing, especially in places like um, uh, food packaging services? So they are also setting up contact tracing teams to help with tracking people who test positive in their offices and then to reach out to them and conduct interviews to understand who else might have been exposed. You know, what meetings did you have last week? Did you have lunch with a colleague? Um, did you ride the elevator with someone and catch up with an old friend? Um, and to quickly reach out and isolate those people to ensure that the um, virus doesn't continue to spread among the employee population. And um, if you're asking people to stay at home, these employers also have EAP type programs, employee assistance programs, and other employer sponsored benefits that are available to help them as they isolate. So it's been really interesting working with a product. It's a SaaS solution that sits on the IBM cloud that's really flexible and configurable that we're able to help and address so many different use cases. It can be applied in all of these different ways. Um, and the only variation here is what kinds of questions are you asking? What kinds of data are you pulling in? And how are you applying that data to create a specific plan for this person who's vulnerable and who needs help right now? So I, I have um, this slide here and maybe I'll just leave it behind for you guys. It's got a bit more detail about Sonoma County and how we were able to help these individuals with complex needs after, um, after the wildfires. So um, I believe this information will be sent out afterwards. So definitely suggest you take a read through. And I guess after talking about all these different stories, you might be curious, how does the technology actually work? And so if you think about how we create connected communities, our solution is actually, Watson Care Manager is three different portals. You have the portal on the top where the care managers or the caseworkers can log in to assess an individual's needs create a plan on how to help that person, and coordinate services to help that person with their recovery. On the bottom left, you have a different portal. This is a place where the community organizations, nonprofits, or clinical providers can log in and post information about all of the different services they have available and uh, coordinate with the care managers to ensure that they're delivering services that are having a positive impact on the person's life. And then in the lower right, you've got a separate portal for your citizens, your patients, um, the people who are either struggling with homelessness or mental health issues or substance use challenges. Those individuals have a place where they can log in, 
collaborate with their care manager, search for services that can help them, and view their care plan so that they can check off the actions um, that they've been assigned so that they can help progress their own recovery. And what that looks like, a couple of screenshots if you can humor me, I'm a product manager, I love screenshots of my products. Um, so what we have in Watson Care Manager is, um, this is in a web browser essentially, it's really easy, flexible to use on, um, on your computer or on your tablet or on your phone. Um, you've got a summary view with all of the different data points that you've captured about the person you're providing care for. So imagine you're a caseworker, you have 10 meetings today with different people who need your help. You're going to log into Watson Care Manager, pull up this data summary, and quickly review everything that's been documented and saved on this individual so that you can follow up with them and have a very effective meeting. Um, we at Watson Health are not trying to build technologies that replace human interactions. We're trying to enhance them. The data and the technology makes the social workers, the case workers, the nurses, the doctors, the radiologists, it makes them um, more effective and able to make faster decisions. Um, it helps them to ensure that they aren't missing something along the way in, in all of the piles and mountains of paperwork that they need to go through. Um, and, and what we do is we build these products in collaboration with the users. So we sit down with those caseworkers and those nurses and get their feedback to ensure that the products are making them more effective. On this page here, just wanted to show you guys that um, you can use APIs and integrate with other data sources to pull in data into a tool like Watson Care Manager, but you can also go through kind of a human-to-human interview-based process where you build out assessments and questionnaires and start documenting answers to those questions here. And those answers can then trigger specific actions to follow up on with this person. So what you want is a tool that's going to help you with um, saving time. So if someone says that they um, are concerned about their housing issues, that should immediately trigger an action on the care plan where the caseworker would know that they have to follow up with Sheila to ensure that she is able to file her paperwork um, uh, for supportive housing. This snapshot here is just quickly to show you all how, how it works when you're looking for services for an individual. So what we've actually built into Watson Care Manager is this really cool registry capability. Um, think of it as a directory where you can list out all of the different organizations that you're partnered with in a community. It could be focused on food or shelter or delivering medicine to the elderly or helping with substance use pro programs or um, group counseling sessions. All of those different um, options and, and service offers in the community could be listed in the directory. And when the care manager comes in, they can pull up the data on that organization, do some research on which is the best fit for the person they're caring for, and book that service all right within the software. As I mentioned before, um, you want to make sure as you're using your um, healthcare data that you're following all of the, the HIPAA rules and standards to keep the um, protected health information safe, the, um, the PHI and the PII. Um, also, you wanna make sure that that data is accessible on the go. So you've got healthcare workers who are not sitting at a desk all day, social services workers who are out in the field visiting individuals who are homeless, maybe in a park and you wanna make sure that they can access that data on the go. And when you're thinking about the way that they access that data, they've got kind of a, um, a plethora of notes that have been collected over time. When we sit down with the caseworkers and we're like, what do you struggle with? And always they're saying like, I can't keep track of all of the information that I've documented about the 100 people that I'm providing care for. There's a volume of information, there's data that's buried in unstructured notes, there's duplicative information that they don't know which notes to sort through and what's more important from the care plan. And so what we've done is we've actually used Watson to build um, a natural language processing tool called Notes Highlight. 
that's able to read through all of those unstructured notes and pull out the highlights of the things that are most important for the caseworker so that they can have um, productive days and most efficient meetings and be prepared for the person they're talking to next. So imagine all of the different things we could train Watson on, clinical notes, identifying names, identifying places, um, identifying uh, kind of social services terminology and social determinants of health data. If they're able to see that summary provided by Watson, they don't have to go digging through hundreds of pages of notes. They can review that snapshot and be ready for their meeting within minutes. Another way that we use data in an interesting manner is um, through this population health data. In Watson Health, we um, actually have a, a pulse survey. It's a consumer healthcare research survey. Um, we also follow consumer, uh, we create consumer profiles and we do segmentation of those, um, of those individuals. And when you think about what kinds of data would be included in addition to all of the clinical information, healthcare data, and um, uh, prevalence of uh, heart disease and diabetes, you're also gonna have, as part of this research, information on how much people make per year, how much do they spend, where do they eat, um, do they take public transportation? Are they investing in their home or are they renting? You know, are they traveling frequently? Are they physically active and going to the gym? All of this information, um, you know, how do they receive their data? Are they TV people or are they on social media? All of that data is going to affect how healthcare providers, governments, and insurance companies, payers, are interacting with their populations. That data is critical. When you think of consumer profiling and consumer segmentation, it's not just for consumer products companies, um, you know, like the big Procter and Gamble's and Unilever's and you know uh, L'Oreal's of the world. It's going to also be really valuable for healthcare and government health and human services. Maybe just a couple examples for you guys on what that data could look like. So the Claritas consumer profiles are super interesting. They've broken down dozens of different groups of populations and found different ways of segmenting people based on age and income and health, um, based on where they live and what their lifestyle traits are. And so one here uh, for this group that I thought would be relevant is the young and influential group. These are gonna be kind of middle income, younger individuals, who um, may not have a, a started a family yet. And you can see kind of in the data where they live, what counties they're concentrated in, how much of the US population they make up, um, you know, if they're using social media, if they struggle with certain diseases or healthcare challenges like cholesterol, um, you know, if they perceive uh, medication to be trusted or, or not. Um, really interesting profiles that can help providers um, and other teams to decide how they're providing care for different populations. And then maybe finally another snapshot here on uh, another way that we can visualize the data in an interesting way using that same pulse survey and prism segmentation. You can also get slices down to the block level um, not even just by zip code. So um, if, I mean, I live in New York City and I can tell you guys, you go one block in one direction and you get a completely different segmentation. Um, you can have different splits on data that show diabetes prevalence or heart disease prevalence, um, income splits by block level. And think about how powerful that data can be when the care managers or caseworkers pick up the phone and call someone and they have insight into this person's life and they can say, I'd like to help you. Um, and they, they know exactly where to start and what the kinds of challenges this person might be facing and have an idea on how to create a plan to help that individual live a healthy life. And so that was, that was about all I had to share with you guys tonight. I'm happy to answer questions, but I think in summary, I've, I've been very fortunate in my career. Um, I'm lucky to be here talking to you guys about a product I love, and I hope you all find things that you can work on that will make a difference in the world and that you can be equally excited about. 
Thank you so much, Liz. That's amazing. I love the work you all are doing over there. Um, so like Liz said, we're going to take a few minutes for a Q&A session now. Um, so Liz, I have a question just to, to start us off. I know when we were speaking um, the other day and reviewing this, you mentioned that um, something like Watson Care Manager can be applied to other sectors um, other than public health data. Do you mind just explaining that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, what's been really exciting in uh, in recent times is seeing how everyone's awareness about the importance of care management is expanding, right? Everyone kind of understands now that healthcare isn't just about the clinical aspect, that, uh, you know, your employer has some responsibility for your health, um, the government does, but also what about schools? So you think about this interesting thing that's happening right now with universities. Um, for those of you who know anyone who's going back to school in the fall, um, how are those schools going to ensure that people are staying um, safe and healthy during um, COVID-19 this year in the dorms or in lecture halls with 100 other people or riding the school shuttle bus or eating in the cafeteria? Um, so you've got kind of this expansion of what people, of, of what kinds of people are using care management and, and um, case management to provide care for people. Um, you're going to see a lot of universities talking about contact tracing, about providing care for the students if they need to isolate or quarantine, about finding them alternative housing so that they're not staying in the same dorm room with other students who are, are not COVID positive. So a lot of really interesting movement um, we're seeing on the employer side um, with private sector companies, but also in universities and schools. So, um, keep an eye on that. I think it's really interesting to watch how the care management space is evolving. Great, thank you. Um, I think Hannah had a question as well. She wants to know if Watson uh, Care Manager can be used internationally. I know we have a lot of international um, members at Women in Data. Yeah, thanks for asking that. So. Um, Watson Care Manager right now is available in the United States. We are um, looking to expand it. So basically, we're, we're a piece of software that sits on the IBM cloud. And as IBM rolls out um, the IBM cloud to various other countries, um, we will also be able to expand to those countries. My understanding, for example, is um, you know IBM is planning on launching the IBM cloud in Canada. I believe it already exists in Germany, covering the EU, in Japan, in Australia and maybe a couple other locations that I'm not thinking of right now. But um, we're kind of tied to the future roadmap of the IBM Cloud and are available to be deployed in those countries. Okay, great. Um, so it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Um, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Obviously, this is the first time that Women in Data has some, done something on YouTube Live. Um, as I said in the, in the introduction, this is the first installment of our three-part series. Next week, uh, Christine Plitt from the Data Incubator will give a talk titled How to Jumpstart Your Data Career. Uh, we hope you all will be able to join us then um, as well. Additionally, Liz's talk today and any of her data references um, with her permission will be available on the Women in Data YouTube channel for your viewing in the future. Um, I'm excited that you all were able to join us this week and I'm looking forward to having you all join us again next week and the following week after that. Um, the third installment will be reviewing DEI, so diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm really excited about that given everything that's going on. Um, so thank you again, Liz, for this amazing presentation, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.